Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today we're gonna talk about the thyroid lab test that you need so you can get a complete picture of what's going on in your health. So typically conventional medicine is only looking at maybe one or two tests and they're not really getting a, a complete view of what's happening in its entirety of the physiology. And that's really important because it really handcuffs the ability of the, the good doctor to make the right steps and changes to address the root underlying cause. So I'm really excited to dig into this topic. I personally have Hashimoto's and thyroid disease, so it's really important for me because I had to find this information to help myself, and now I'm really trying to help thousands of people, millions of people out there online. So if you need more help, make sure you subscribe below. You can click below and schedule a consult with myself and my staff so we can look deeper at your thyroid pattern and give you options so we're focusing on getting to the root cause, not just giving you some medication to make your TSH look pretty, but then you're stuck with all these thyroid symptoms we want to make everything work better. TSH, T4, T3, everything. And we're going to talk about that in just one sec. And the nice thing about these chats is they're live. So I'm, this is live. There's no script. This is just me off the cuff, um, just expressing the knowledge I have out there for y'all. And then you guys can come in with some questions pertinent to the topic of thyroid, and I'd love to answer it. So let's dig in here off the bat. All right. So first off, your thyroid. Conventional medicine is looking at your thyroid, which is located right here. So if you just feel the Adam's apple, so for me it's right there, it's about down and out one centimeter. Okay, that's your thyroid gland. So in conventional medicine, they're going to palpate it. They may have you swallow some water and feel, make sure it feels smooth, make sure there's no knowledge, uh, nodules or it feels inflamed. Um, if, if that is the case, they may go to an ultrasound and look at it from that perspective or maybe a biopsy for cancer, right? Those are the extremes. Now we have some of the blood testing that is looked at to assess the thyroid. We have TSH, which is actually part of the pituitary back here that sits on the cella turcica, and that's going to be producing stimulating hormones, okay? So TSH comes out of the pituitary, and that goes down to the thyroid, and it's like kind of whipping the horse. It's saying, hey, make some T4, make some relatively inactive thyroid hormone. Then that T4 gets converted downstream to T3. And T3 is your more active thyroid hormone. That's your, it's about three to 400% more metabolically active. Now, T4, right? It, they call it T4 because there's, four, it's basically a tyrosine amino acid with four molecules of iodine attached to it. All right. There's free T4 and then there's total T4. So how it works is your hormones bind things up with a protein. Why does it do that? Because if all the hormone was free coming out of the gland, all of your metabolic activity would be here, right? It wouldn't be able to get to the rest of your body. So you have most of that tissue, most of that hormone, two to 5% is going to be, um, sorry, two to 5% is going to be free, but most of it outside of that, you know, that free percentage is going to be protein bound. 95 to 97% is going to be protein bound so it can move around and mobilize. So when we look at T4 total, we're getting a window of the gland strength, how much hormone is actually coming out of the gland. When we look at the free component, we're looking at what's biologically active. We want to see T4 total somewhere between 6 and 10. And this is kind of um, United States lab ranges. I use LabCorp Quest. And then the T4 free, we want between 1 and 1 1.5. 1, 2, 1, 3 is like ideal, right, if we're really perfect. Going upstream, TSH, we like closer to one. I'll go as low as 0.5, as high as 2.5-ish. But TSH isn't the full story. A lot of people have pretty TSHs, but when we go downstream to look at T4 or T3 or antibodies or reverse T3, we have problems there. And that's why we got to look deeper. So we have TSH, right? That's the brain hormone. TSH talks to the uh, T4, right? We have free and total coming out of the thyroid, free give us a window into biological activation, what's there for the receptor sites, T4 total, it gives us a window of glandular strength. And then we have this conversion process where we're looking at T3 free and total. The free and total is the same kind of mindset. The free is what's biologically active that can bind to a receptor site and work, okay? So let me just give you an analogy here. So this is a hormone right here, okay? This is a receptor site. So a free hormone is like a pen that has the cap off, and then here's the cap just waiting for it. That's your T3 free going into the receptor site, okay? And imagine the total, imagine like another cap already over this, and it just won't fit, right? That's how hormones work. It's kind of a lock and key method.
So when we look at T3, we're really looking at what's biologically active. And it's important because one of the big biological or biochemical or physiological impediments is this T4 to T3 conversion that happens where we don't have the nutrients or we have hormonal imbalance on the, on the insulin side or we have hormonal imbalance on the cortisol side, either high or low, that can affect that thyroid conversion. Certain nutrients like low amino acids, low zinc, low magnesium, low selenium, vitamin A, even copper, these are important nutrients that help that conversion happen. So T3s are more metabolically active, so we wanna make sure we have adequate levels of T3 total and T3 free. What does that look like on T3 total? We're looking at above 100. T3 free, we're looking at you know three or above. And that's important. And we may also look at reverse T3. So reverse T3, remember here's the hormone, here's T3 and here's the receptor site, right? Reverse T3 does the opposite. It actually gets into the receptor site. So that's like kind of covering up the cap here. So reverse T3 gets in there. And now when the T3 goes to, to bind, it can't do it. And reverse T3 is going to be your inactive T3. It's like putting meta, It's like putting metabolic blanks in your metabolic gun, so to speak. So in general, stress, adrenal stress, low calorie dieting, poor sleep, uh, lots of exercise. It's our body's way of slowing things down. So it's your it's the natural mechanism of like, okay, let's chill out. We don't want to accelerate the metabolism. We're going to slow everything down. And that's kind of the mindset there, okay? And now here's the X factor. We have thyroid antibodies that aren't even looked at by most people in conventional medicine. This is super important because thyroid antibodies give us a window into what the underlying mechanism of the thyroid condition is. If you have Hashimoto's, right, that's where you have positive TPO and, and or thyroglobulin antibodies that tells you that your immune system is beating up your thyroid. And eventually these thyroid follicles will get bursted and disrupted and fibrotic tissue will infiltrate and that tissue will no longer be functional. It's kind of like having a chronic back or knee issue. Eventually uh, it just gets really creaky and there's a lot of scar tissue and then that knee or back doesn't move like it used to. That's kind of how the thyroid works when it comes to autoimmune disease. So we look at TPO antibodies, we look at thyroglobulin antibodies to see if that attack is there. Now this is really important because conventional medicine typically ignores this very important part. Why? Because it doesn't change the course of treatments. It does not make the doctor do something different. If TSH is high, you're getting a, prescript for, a prescription for Synthroid or Levothyroxine or Levothroid, which is going to be a synthetic T4 with a sodium bound to it. And the problem with that is a lot of people, you can make the TSH drop into a pretty zone, but a lot of people don't have that T4 to T3 conversion in there. And there's still some potential corn fillers that can still stimulate the immune system. So a lot of people still walk around with this underlying autoimmune attack happening. And there's a 78% 78% chance if you have one autoimmune condition that you're going to have a second one, right? This is polyglandular autoimmune syndrome, PGAS for short. So really important. We have to look at the underlying issue. And we know gluten, we know infections, we know gut permeability is all going to exacerbate this autoimmune mechanism. Of course, there's a genetic predisposition that's there as well. So we really want to get to the root cause of what's going on. And these, these components are going to be missed typically. All right, I'm going to open it up for any questions here with anyone on the thyroid aspect. I don't think we have any specific questions on that yet. I'm hoping it's because I just did such a good job and, and answered them off the bat. So just kind of in summary for anyone listening here, you want to see a good conventional doc, I'm sorry, a good functional medicine doc. Typically your conventional doc will only run TSH and maybe T4 if you're lucky. And if those look pretty, there's no hope. And the problem is most of the patients that I see their TSH and their T4 looks pretty. And this is where it's tough because then they go to their conventional doc and they're like, no, you're fine. And then typically the next escalation is if they keep on going back, they say, yeah, well, you know what? I'm going to write you a prescription for Wellbutrin or Paxil or Zoloft, right? An SSRI or an antidepressant medication. So that's the next step. And the problem is those medications don't fix the underlying issue. Your doctor is just trying to numb you out because they don't want to they're not educated enough to deal with the underlying imbalance. And then um, what what ranges did I say the T4 was for? So, T, so let me go over the ranges. TSH, we want between 0.5 and 2.5, okay? One's ideal for TSH. For T4 free, we want between 1 and 1 1.5. For T4 total, between 6 and 10. For T3 free, 3 to 4 is ideal. For T3 total, 100 or above, 1 to 150 is ideal. For antibodies, 
Typically, LabCorp, LabCorp isn't a flag anything on the TPO side, uh, 34 and up. Quest will do it uh, 10 or up. The thyroglobulin is typically going to be flagged um, greater than 0.9 and up. So you can see I have these ranges memorized because I literally look at them many times a day, dozens of times a week. So it's important that you know I have mastery on my side here. And then Donna writes in, what am I taking from my Hashimoto's? That's an awesome question, Donna. Here's the thing. Because I was able to get my autoimmune, my autoimmune antibody attack down early, um, just nutrients. Just nutrients were enough for me to keep my autoimmunity in check. I keep my TSH below two. My T3 levels are just above three. My T4 levels are in the functional range. So I'm able to manage it. There's still a low grade of antibodies, but I just make sure I keep adequate nutrition like magnesium, selenium, zinc, and CoQ10 in there manage my stress and I stay away from all grains and that makes a huge difference on my autoimmunity. I'm able to keep it in check. If I didn't do that, I did the wrong thing, and ate a standard American diet, my autoimmunity would be flaring and I would probably need thyroid hormone replacement like moving forward forever. So it's really important. Uh, there are some people that we, we see that may need that, but we got to work on all the functional things first, see how much we can help. And then if we do have to give thyroid hormone we're giving a natural desiccated bioidentical thyroid hormone without any of the fillers in there. We're going to make recommendations. Or we're going to give thyroid support that's going to support a lot of the nutrients. My recommendations are always to give the gland what it needs nutritional-wise, see how much it can make on its own, work on the adrenal component because that's one of the missing components to this whole thing. It's really not looked at um, deep enough. And then what are rich iodine foods for thyroid support? I mean, obviously you have good quality seaweed. Um, it can be reasonable. You got to be careful with going too high in the iodine because that can stimulate autoimmunity. And then you can also see egg yolks have a little bit of iodine in there. If you go to myfooddata.com, myfooddata.com, and just click iodine, it'll give you the top 10 list of your iodine foods. And we'll have a blog article coming out on your top iodine foods as well. Let's see here. Rona writes in, can cytomel cause bowel issues, diarrhea, Went off antidepressants and then started. Only difference was going on Cytomel six months earlier. It's possible because low thyroid hormone can also cause constipation. So does it make sense from a mechanism standpoint that high thyroid hormone could cause diarrhea? Yes, it does. It's very possible. Again, I'm not a huge fan of Cytomel. Some people do well with it. Um, my concern is that you just you have to be on it. It's got a really short half-life. You really have to be on it correctly probably taking it three to four times a day. For most people, you really cannot skip doses. All right, y'all. Hope this um, podcast or slash video was really helpful. If you want to dive in deeper with myself or my clinicians, feel free to click below, schedule with myself, an intro consult, and make sure you subscribe. Give me a share. Get this information out to any friends or family that needs it. This information is in severe deficit. So I want to make sure everyone is supported. All right, here. Uh, last question by Cynthia. If my doctor won't test anything but T4 and TSH, uh, with half my thyroid removed, how much will testing on my own generally cost? I do have gut complaints and fatigue. Great question, Cynthia. So if you go over to my site, justinhealth.com slash shop, click on the lab test section, you'll be able to purchase a, a complete and a abridged thyroid panel right from there. And the, 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 the abridged panel right around 100 to 120, up to 160 for the complete. Um, the only difference with the complete is it doesn't have the complete has all the hormones where the the a bridge does not have the reverse T3 as well as the the T4 total and the T3 total. It still has TSH, it still has T4 free, T3 free, and all the antibodies. So typically with patients off the bat, I recommend a complete to start, and then we'll typically just do the abridged moving forward unless we see high reverse T3. Because most of the the most important T4 and T3 number is the free because that's what's biologically available. If you remember with my analogy with the pen cap and the receptor site. Uh, if I go off thyroid, kick back on and use natural therapies instead. So if you're on a thyroid support already and you're diagnosed by your conventional medical doctor, you really got to work with someone to make sure um, coming off of that isn't going to be a problem. And you got to monitor it, right? It's not something you want to do willy-nilly. If, if your TSH starts going back up, that's not good. That's going to whip your thyroid and can potentially cause swelling of that thyroid. So we got to be careful, all right? All right, y'all, I got to jump onto a patient call here. You guys have a phenomenal day. Thumbs up, like, share, hit the bell. I'll be back tomorrow for more great videos. Thanks. Take care.